Yo, 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 guys, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Marijuana Essay Weekly. And today we have the famous Myrtle Clark coming to tell us a little bit about her history in growing. Uh, we all know her as the legend who has gotten cannabis legislation to where it is today, but not a lot of us and you guys out there know that she is actually a skilled grower and uh, has been uh, growing for quite some time and has picked up a couple of tips and tricks that we hope to share with you guys today. Uh, Dean, is there something that you're expecting to... Uh, any secrets that you're expecting to be leaked or anything like that? <laughs> so I've seen Myrtle's gardens and they're beautiful, uh, uh, you know, so it's sort of apart from cannabis itself. So I'm keen to just hear some, you know, I think there'll be some interesting tips and tricks and uh, it's always exciting to hear a new perspective of uh, someone who enjoys cultivation as well. So yeah, really looking forward to finding out a few, a, a little bit more info related to, you know, some some alternative people's uh, tips and tricks related to growing cannabis. And uh, we love having Myrtle on the show. So I'm sure she's going to bring us some really cool information. Uh, thanks so much for, for obviously coming on and uh, being ready to share a little bit of information about uh, you as a grower. Um, I did mention in the intro that you've obviously the, the legend that's gotten cannabis uh, to where it is today um, and that allows people to grow legally at home. And yeah, now we kind of want to hear a little bit about your time as a grower and less of a time as an activist because I think a lot of people know that you have done a lot for the activism but not a lot of people know that you also grow uh, so with my first question if I could just ask uh, how long you've been growing for and why you got started growing <laughs> Um, uh, so I actually, when you sent the questions through, I did a quick calculation on my fingers and, uh, this year it'll be 22 years since I grew my first cannabis plant. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, when you look back, uh, I mean, I feel like I'm still the same, exactly the same person as I was <laughs> 22 years ago, but, um, for you guys who are millennials and Gen, Gen Zs and all of that, <laughs> it seems like a, a, a long time, but that was um the first time i grew one cannabis plant <laughs> amazing <laughs> and myrtle why did you get into into growing out of interest or love for gardening um a bit of a a, a combination of the two um so i've been uh consuming cannabis since i was about 19 years old and uh, never really thought of growing my own you know we used to just go and buy a banky on the street corner um, and it, there was no strain involved or anything. You just bought dacha. Um, Then I moved to the beautiful Russellers Valley in the Eastern Free State. Um, and there we were uh, very blessed to have lots and lots of people from the traveling community um, and the, the, the party circuits and the music people. And obviously those kinds of people are, always use cannabis. <laughs> So uh, I, I started encountering more and more experts on the cannabis in the cannabis field. And then um, the one the first spring that I was in the valley, um, a, a plant came out up outside my front door. <laughs> and so I said, uh, I said to the guys, well, I don't know, uh, pull it out, whatever. They said, no, 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 leave it and see what happens <laughs> and see if it's a male or a female. And I'm like, male or female, what? You know, they said, no, no. So that was the first thing that I learned. So we let this volunteer uh, grow mm -hmm. and it got absolutely as enormous because <laughs> uh, we know that that's, that's what happens to volunteers yeah. that come yeah. up at this time of the year. Um, yeah, exactly. I've got quite a lot of seeds in my compost here. So I have weed plants coming up all over the desert. <laughs> So that's that's how it really started. And then uh, when it came time to harvesting it, we all got together in a big circle on the floor with a sheet. And uh, I had my first lesson in trimming how to hang it, how to dry it. But it wasn't, now looking back, it wasn't the best kind of <laughs> weed. But that was a start. And then we were in those days um, a permaculture center. And, okay. um, and so I had... As a spin-off of being there, I had been supervising the vegetable gardens with the expert input from the permaculture people because I ran the restaurant there. And we had um, a seed-to-plate type of cuisine where 
We managed wow. to, even under the hardest conditions in the free state, um, we managed to grow about 40% of the wow. the veggies and stuff that we needed for the restaurant. So that was quite an achievement. And I, I really learned a lot. It was certainly on the job training. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Um, I also now want to jump into a little bit of the nitty gritty, uh, or maybe not so much. Um, but we have a lot of first time growers that are starting out in the grow scene. Um, they are maybe uh, obviously uh, not so experienced in the space and probably want to get into this for the first time. Uh, what kind of tips would you offer to someone who's sort of fresh into growing and it's the first time they're looking at it and want to get into it? Well, you know, it all starts with the seed. And so I think that if you're a, if you're a first time grower, you really should grow from seed. Um, mm -hmm. We know that there are amazing clones of amazing cultivars available all over our beautiful country. But I think to get the full conception of the plant from the seed to your final smoking, your first bud, um, I think it's important to get that whole picture. Mm. So um, uh, in the valley, uh, after my first year of my enormous, ginormous plant, um, I was I was lucky to be working with a chef from Switzerland at the time who had uh, been traveling and collecting seeds from around the world. Oh, so. Wow. Um, but between him, his name was Pierre, and my friend called Dom, who was an OG grower, who actually ha held the first cannabis cup in South Africa in 1991 in KZN. Oh it's called the wow. Dacha Conferenzi. <laughs> it's called the Dacha Conferenzi. And my friend Derek, who made the cup for the for the East Coast Cannabis Cup that I went to at the beginning of May, he also made the cup for that first Dacha Conferency in 1991. Oh so gosh. anybody who tells you that they're holding the first Cannabis Cup in South Africa is wrong. I know because <laughs> there was this one in 1991. Yeah. <laughs> so between the Swiss chef and the Permi OG Dacha grower Dom, um, we, we came up with some seeds and we decided that we would grow six plants. So to start off with, I would certainly advise to grow from seed and not clones and to start off with say four to six plants. Mm. And maybe you want to plant um, uh, 10 or 12 seeds yeah. because if, unless your seeds are feminized, and I wouldn't say use feminized seeds because you want to get the full extent of the genetics. Mm. So maybe you can plant 10, 12, maybe even 20 seeds because you, you obviously might have some males. Mm, so yes. that was the next thing that I learned. And it's all over the Internet. You'll just have to Google it. The difference between a male and female cannabis plant. Mm. Then you need to, after you have germinated your seeds, and I know that you guys have got videos on germinating, then you want to plant your seed, in my preference, um, into, a, into about a five liter bag mm. or pot. Yes once okay. it's terminated so mm. that you can watch those very very early stages of the growth you don't want to be putting that seedling straight into the ground yeah. then um and i'm only talking about outdoor growing here mm. because yes. i have a very big vested interest in african sun-kissed cannabis <laughs> and so um uh, and we don't have enough ESCOM for for the for the people to grow their frankenweed indoors. So uh, I'll promote it to the nth degree. Um, once you have transferred your little seedling into its five liter pot, then you have a um, you know you have a window of about uh, maybe six weeks uh, to then observe the growth of the plant. Um, and you can see when the first leaves come out, when the secondary leaves, when the tertiary leaves see the, the stem starting to thicken out. And then once you have the plant at about um, maybe 20 to 30 centimeters, and you're feeling that that, strong is, that plant is nice and strong, um, then you can, you can plant it out into, into your garden in the outdoors. Um, uh, there's very few places in South Africa where you can't grow outdoors. And uh, I think what I learned right in the beginning was the time to plant. Because mm. one's, one thinks that it's now that it's spring, one must plant. But yes. you must remember, particularly if you have, um, uh, you must check on your seeds or check with your seed supplier, how many weeks to flowering. Mm. So some of the known as sativa, I mean, I don't really like that term because there's no such thing, but some of those sativa dominant strains will take 
from now, August, September, all the way until April, May to flower. So that's a yes. long growing season. Mm. Then you might have some of the Northern European um, uh, cultivars or the Afghanistan, uh, the cultivars in Afghani or Nepalese origin, mm. um, known as your sort of indicas, who will have a much shorter flowering season. Mm. So when to plant is really important because the rule is bigger is not better. You want to have a manageable size plant because remember you're going to have to trim for the first time. <laughs> yes. And you're, going to up, you're going to end up having to get your your brothers and sisters and aunties and cousins and uncles and everybody in and they get you're also going to give them sore fingers, you know? <laughs> but you don't want an unmanageably big plant. And for outdoor or greenhouse cultivation, I grow under shade clock. Um, I would suggest leave it until at least October. Mm. October, November until uh, the middle of de December is my optimal planting uh, time. And then it is sometimes a good idea to stagger the growth. So you don't plant all your seeds at once. One week you plant three, the next week you plant three. So then they're not all going to flower at the same time and you end up with a lot of weed to trim. Mm -hmm. um, so you want the kind of staggered planting is a good idea and then I like to write everything down so you get yourself your piece of paper or your excel spreadsheet or whatever then you say right I've got three white widow seeds and you write down the date that it was germinated the date that it popped through the 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 uh, shell of the seed uh, the day that it got its first leaves its second leaves so you've got a little plant diary going and also take photographs. Mm -hmm. So take photographs just when the seed pops and all of that. Then you've got this whole life cycle of the plant. Photographs, videos, nice little time lapses if you have that skill. And really record your, your journey with this plant. Because we always say that cannabis is a teacher plant. And if you plant, if you are just learning or it's your second or your third crop, um, you this plant will teach you lots of things lots mm. of things like you might get pests and then you can go yes. to marijuana SA and look at the video on pests and then you could record that in your plant diary mm. and you will learn a lot more about plants and botany than you will necessary about cannabis mm. you know you'll learn about nature and the soil and the cycles of the sun and the weather and how it affects our beautiful cannabis plants yeah, I must say that 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 note taking part is is such a a, a good thing on in my part. Just like that, you can build that knowledge and it's reflect back because it's not. I don't know. It's, I struggle to remember what I had for lunch yesterday, let alone what, <laughs> what I fed my plants. You know, six months ago. <laughs> Yeah, and also on the photo taking, it sometimes feels like things are happening slowly if you're looking every day. But if you're sort of taking photos a week apart and then backdating in a, in a couple of months, you actually see how crazy some of the, the growth can be and how quickly some of the some of the parts happen. Uh, Myrtle, I just want to touch a little bit on, you've mentioned permaculture a few times. Uh, it's also quite a popular, uh, amongst our, our viewers, it's quite a, a, a popular talking point. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how uh, one could, uh, or do you feel that uh, sort of working a permaculture garden can also help you grow better cannabis oh yes for sure so in in my early days of growing when we grew those um six plants the following year after the big volunteer um i also was uh, one of my neighbors was an og grower from the uk and he was actually one of the people who developed the um the exodus cheese strain oh, wow. uh, in the late 70s and he was he was mr nutrients you know um mm. so uh, and i knew about nutrients and compost teas and all of that from permaculture so uh he actually taught me how to integrate all of that nutrient knowledge into the cannabis grow and i started making my own nutrients so that's that's a um a really good starting point um and uh it's a bit complicated to to add here but basically yes. what you need is you need an a nitrogen fixing nutrient for the vegetative state of your plant before it started flowering then you need a flowering um nutrient for when for when the fl plant starts to bud and then you have a crossover period where you give uh, both of those nutrients mm, so yes. In permaculture, with permaculture principles, we use um, companion planting. Mm. 
So uh, uh, my garden has everything from um, uh, uh, comfrey and yarrow, uh, which are nutrient, nutrient, nitrogen fixing plants. I use those to around my beds and dotted around the beds. Okay. Um, I also, uh, and then I use those also to make the nutrients. So I can make a comfrey tea. Uh, and then when the yarrow plants flower, I use the flowering heads to make a flowering tea. Okay. Uh, not so much anymore because it's quite time consuming, but this that's the principle of it. Yes. Also, um, uh, build up the beds uh, in layers. I use the raised, raised beds and okay. you uh, build them up in, in layers over the, the beds here at the Jazz Farm are now 18 years old. Wow. So, and those are no till beds. So you have to resist the temptation at the end of winter when you're preparing your beds to actually get a fork in there and lift it all up and turn it all over and make it look fresh. No, you want to actually build it up in layers. So what I do is in the begin in autumn when all the leaves fall, I gather all the leaves around and I put those on the beds. Then those are there throughout winter. And then uh, in, in, uh, at the beginning of spring, I start putting mulch in it, usually grass mulch, lawn clippings, yes. or bales of grass that I get from the animal feed place. Mm. So um, companion planting, there's also a lot of that on the on the internet of how to do companion planting. Um, raised beds, no-till beds, because that way you encourage wildlife in your garden yes. everything from under the soil you have all of your mycelium which is your fungi that that connects the whole universe together mm -hmm. and if you dig into our beds here you will see like fine little white threads of what looks almost like mold but it's not that's mycelium which is allowing all the plants to communicate with each other under the soil plus of course the earthworms and the little grubs that live in the soil then I've always said that the best thing about sun-kissed African cannabis is that you need a little bit of uh, grasshopper poop. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you need a little bit of this and that. So yes. we also plant uh, quite a lot of flowers, sweet peas, marigolds, cosmos, that type of thing, okay. because it will also distract the various insects from your cannabis plant if you're providing them some nice flowers, you know? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> So above the ground um, is also very important to to take to take note of, you know, and 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 your companions, um, and uh, also a lesson that I learned early on is you really need a two meter squared patch per plant. Okay. Don't crowd your plants too much and be careful when you can when you companion planting in and around your garden. Uh, not to plant the companions too close either. So yes. really, um, uh, really plan how many plants uh, you're going to plant according to the space that you have. Don't cram them in there mm. because once our, I know on the high felt our summer rains come, you're just going to have problems with powdery mildew. You know, you yes. really are. And those plants relying on the sunlight. So you want that canopy of the plant to get as maximum amount of sun as you can. So don't squash the plants in. Rather dot them around. You don't have to have a duck a patch. You can mm. yes. put your put your plants all over the garden. You know, one in the front garden for your passers by to see, and one <laughs> one in your veggie garden, and you know, one in the back garden or whatever. If you don't have that space, it's much better to dot them around than to try and have this weed patch that you've only got a limited amount of space. And yeah, because a lot of the time, if you make it too heavy on just cannabis, then you're creating a sort of hot spot to to get attacked. Yes. Whereas if you spread yes. everything out, if one gets infected, it's not the end of the world because that was maybe exactly. a spot that wasn't that great. And then next year, you know yeah. not to plant there. Yeah. <laughs> and then you observe that and you yes. rice it all down in your bed. Note to self, yeah. not good spot. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And then in terms of, uh, obviously, throughout your, your days in the cannabis space, you've smoked some um, particular strains and you may have developed some that you like and some that you don't like. Uh, do you have any preferences, favorites, least favorites, uh, or are you in the middle? Uh, what's your What's your take on that? 
You know, I'm quite a big fan of the of the OG strains, and as far as those are concerned, I'm a big lover of Jack Herra. You know, mm, yeah, um, he amazing. I mean, um, Sensi Seeds have been an awesome support, and they, um, you know, they made the Jack Herra uh, strain in his honor many years ago, um, and I love the story about the man who was actually quite a revolting slob apparently apparently he was not a very clean person and he lived in quite squalid conditions but he was <laughs> such an awesome awesome grandfather of activism so yes. um uh, and you know I've, I've had lots of hippies in my life over the years and <laughs> i have a i have a soft spot for an og hippie you know <laughs> um and then um uh, quite a lot of the african strains i really like there was one hybrid uh that that came out of out of Spain a few years ago. That was well, quite a, probably about fifteen years ago. Called Super Congo, and there's mm -hmm. been various um, iterations of the Congo strain since then. But um, it's something if I if I find anything on our travels or through our networks with with those Congo strains in it, they they're very very interesting. And I grew Super Congo for many years until I ran out of seeds and cuttings and all of that. Oh, so no. I'm always on the lookout. Mm. And um and then uh general land land races to mm. smoke I like lank dank you know mm. I really do I I I like some indoor Franken weed as I call it <laughs> uh, and I also have a I have a very high tolerance um mm. so uh the I, I really like strong cannabis mm. but as far as for growing cannabis. I love to love to grow land races and I'm very excited that a friend of mine is coming from Mexico at the end of oh, November wow. and she's bringing me some uh, South American land race strains. So we're going to grow those uh, wow. in our Sativa City project this year. So those are sort of my favorites to grow the land races and my favorites to smoke are the Lank Danks. <laughs> and Jack <Harrow>. yes. <laughs> thanks so much Myrtle um, yeah it's always a pleasure to have you on and I think uh, actually we, we learned quite a, a few interesting things about you today so we're super glad to have had you on um, for everyone listening just always to remember to check out Fields of Green for All uh, they do amazing work Myrtle's been leading that for many years and is probably part of the reason that cannabis is where it is today and that yeah an inspiration to us from way back when to probably even get into the industry. So as always, thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> and thank you guys for all the support that you gave for Fields of Green for All. And remember that we've only got less than a month away to the anniversary of our constitutional court hearing. And um, it's not over till it's over. We've been waiting mm -hmm. for four years. So let's see what happens on the anniversary. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks so much. Thanks, Myrtle. Myrtle. I love getting into like, yeah, it was so cool to hear sort of some back history related to OG growers and, you know, sort of, I love the permaculture as well. Yeah, it's always so cool, you know, like a lot of us uh, get stuck into different parts of the industry, but I think there's a big passion that every, a lot of us do have within it. And that is sort of going back to growing. And also, you know, I also like to say that you, you learn a lot more about uh, just general gardening and sort of getting involved in growing your own things through cannabis or vice versa. And it's it's cool to see that uh, Myr Myrtle's sort of journey has been quite similar as well, you know? What would you say is your key takeaway from it all? I would say that, uh, you know, I really like the beginner's tips that Myrtle did give, uh, mm. learning that cannabis is a plant and it's alive and it's not just a plug and play thing that happens, you know, is a is a big part of, of a cult the cultivation journey. So I think sort of uh, the beginner's tips, tips from this episode were really spot on and, uh, you know, uh, growing a regular seed for the first time and getting a monster and uh, is a really good way to hook yourself into growing your own. It was my also my first plant was also a volunteer in the back garden grew five meters tall you know and it was uh the reason that i got hooked on or hooked on growing so uh mm. i think if you want to get hooked uh, get a couple regs uh, get yeah. them in the garden and grow some trees <laughs> yeah no I, I think with uh i was also geeking out i think with um imagine uh, so guys is this like free note-taking app notion um and just like imagine what you could do these days with like documenting the journey of your plant growth taking photos recording it all in there recording your nutrient measurements all of those things and it's like such a key takeaway uh because you know 
the knowledge you gain growing it is it's a difficult thing to learn it's like being a you know a pianist or a, a you know anything you want to master you really have to be diligent at just like keeping those learning what learning from your mistakes and yeah if something happened like a year ago now it's a year later you may only see the repercussions far down the line so yeah that i think was a really cool takeaway but guys you've watched along and it's meet, uh, meant the world to us that you've joined us today um it always does it always brings us pleasure when you guys leave a comment and uh all you guys that have subscribed to us over the years it's uh, awesome um we love what we do and we hope to see you guys in another episode